All right, guys, it is November 12th, 2020. Um, I can't quite see right now because I don't have my glasses on because one, I didn't want to put on my contacts. And if I put on my glasses, you see these, you see the ring light, light on my glasses. You see that? And so to make sure that we don't distract myself or you guys get distracted, I'm going to do today's daily Bible a little blind, but um, we're looking at 2 Chronicles 9. We're going to look at verses 13 to 31. 13 to 31, all right? Uh, let me pray first and then we can start. Lord, we just thank you for this time. And as always, may your word not just simply instruct our minds, but may our hearts connect with your presence. Because that is the point of the word, is the word not only teach us, but offers us an opportunity to encounter you, a living God. And so may we encounter you today. May we, through whatever we're going through, encounter you. I also pray, God, that I know there's a lot of heaviness in the in the atmosphere right now, Lord. I, I know that uh, seasonal affect disorder or sadness is around because of not only weather, but this prolonged quarantine. But we pray, Father, for your spirit to minister to us in the places that we are at and bring us to a place where we need to be in you. We thank you and just I pray. Amen. All right. We're looking at Second Chronicles 9, verse 13 to 31. And it said, I'm just going to read it one straight through. There, and there's only one thing I kind of want to talk about today. So I think today's devotion is going to be a little short, but it's something where on a practical scale, it will really, there's a lot of practicality in today's uh, daily Bible. And there should be practicality in every devotional, right? But more so today, uh, I had a lot of time reflecting about like the practical things about the thing that was stood out to me today. And so let's look at verse 13 of chapter 9 of 2nd Chronicles. It says, the weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents. Not including the revenues brought in by merchants and traders. Also, all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the territories brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of hammered gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold with 300 shekels of gold in each shield. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with pure gold. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold was attached to it. On both sides of the seat were armrests with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships manned by Hiram servants. Once every three years, it returned carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold and robes and weapons and spices and horses and mules. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from all other countries. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Nathan the prophet, in the prophecy of Hijah the Shalonite, and the visions of Edo the seer, Concerning Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. All right. We're talking about Solomon's splendor. We're talking about Solomon's wealth. We're talking about how rich he was. And you can tell 
the man was very rich to the point where silver was as common as dirt um and was even considered valuable you know gold everything was gold gold on gold on gold and he just was the kingdom was thriving right you look at this now you might gravitate to that first number that the talents of gold was 666 i don't want to over spiritualize that it is what it is but you know we've been talking about solomon right we've been talking about how he started well ended poorly and today's passage a, a question came up to me and i was kind of reflecting on today's passage solomon was given all this wealth now stop right now i want you to pay attention real carefully to what i'm about to say money is not evil money is not wrong but it is when we love it and worship it and are willing to sacrifice God for it, that's when it becomes evil. The love of money is evil in the sense that we willing to even compromise ourselves to get it. Um, it is oftentimes one of the biggest idols in anyone's life because of what it can do. Now, so being rich doesn't mean you're less spiritual. You can be rich and spiritual in the same style it's just that the thing with materialistic wealth or riches is that there's a huge temptation to trust in that to find security in that and to worship that that's why it's it's, it's a tricky kind of slippery slope but money in of itself or to have a lot of it is not a bad thing and, and sometimes i know we associate true christianity as being poor you just because you're poor, you could be you could be just as sinful as when you're rich as when you're poor. There's sinful poor people, there's sinful rich people, and sinful middle class people. Sin doesn't discriminate by your economic status, right? It just there's different temptations that come with that. And so a question. So we were I was in seminary a while ago, and uh, one of the professors knew uh, uh, the celebrity pastor. Uh, the dean and he was teaching a class and he was he gave this example about money and so he knew the celebrity pastor now the celebrity pastor on facebook posted a new car that he has just purchased because he's a he's a well-known pastor probably makes a lot of money not just simply from the church or speaking engagements but through his books and on his facebook he posted a picture of an, a brand new aston martin now if you don't know what an aston martin is it's a very expensive car. I'm just going to leave it at that. More expensive than a Beamer and a Mercedes-Benz. I mean, again, depending on what models you get, but generally speaking, more expensive. And, man, the comment section, man, if you want to talk about wild comment sections, supposedly Christian comment sections are wild enough because there's people arguing, hating, and doing everything but loving one another, right? And so, in this comment section, you'll hear, you've seen people like oh wow god blessed you okay some comments would be like oh man look at this false prophet flaunting his worldly riches okay and then you have the, some people that's just like oh cool car now is that wrong and that was a question for today for our class and we had a heated debate and uh the conclusion that I came to was that for him to have that car is not wrong it's his money he earned it in the sense that he worked for it and then God blessed him he could do whatever he wants with that money right now the phrase that I want you to think about and I want you to hold on to is everything's permissible everything's permitted or take that with the grain of salt not sin is not permitted obviously right Everything's permissible, as Paul says, but not everything's beneficial, right? So there's things that are permissible in this life that are okay, but you have to ask ourselves, is it beneficial to my faith and to my walk and my life and relationship with God? So for, for instance, this car is permissible. It's permissible to have. There's nothing wrong with it. There's, nothing, there's no sin behind it, but is it beneficial? That is a question. And... One thing that, I, again, I'm not judging that person. 
he he earned it man he could do whatever he wants if he wanted to buy a horse by all means do what do whatever you want it's your money but one thing that i've come to realize is this going off that phrase everything's permissible but not everything's beneficial when i look at as a christian leader i'm like as as a, as a pastor let's say one day i get financially blessed right and I'm able to buy a Benz or a Beamer or whatever car you usually wouldn't see a pastor in, right? You know, we, people are, pastors are notoriously known as not having a lot of money. We're almost at the brink of just walking around on with our sandals or if not a horse. But whatever the case may be, we're not, we're not, you don't go into be a pastor to become rich. If you do, you're in the wrong profession, right? But let's just say I get financially blessed and then I get like a, a Beamer or something. Is that something where that is going to be beneficial to the flock that, that I minister to? Now, again, there's nothing wrong if I have that. But let's raise the stakes. Let's say I get a Porsche or a Lamborghini, something very extravagant. Is it wrong for me to have that? No. But then a question that, and this is just for me, there's a question that I had to ask myself, but is this going to be beneficial to the community of faith around me? And, you, and the people can answer back and say, who cares about other people? It's about you. It's your own life. But the reality is God calls us to live in community. God calls us to be a community that builds one another, that encourages one another, that takes account of one another and where they are at in their faith. And so therefore, don't think, oh, it's just my own life. But the very thing is that our lives do have impact and influence to others around us, whether we know it or not. And so I have to ask myself, does me having like a Lamborghini benefit the body of Christ in the sense that will it cause more division or will it cause more unity? Let me explain. As a pastor, my, my income comes from the church. And where does that come from? It comes from the tithe and offerings of the people. If I go around driving a Lamborghini and I know that there's a congregate member in my church, my fellow brother or sister that is suffering but is faithfully tithing or doing whatnot, giving love offerings, and I'm going around driving a Lambo, I, that doesn't sit well over here in my heart. How can I live in this lap of luxury knowing that there's other people in my community that are suffering? Again, nothing wrong with me having it. But it's a question that we all have to frame in terms of finances, in terms of wealth, in terms of the especially wealth, because that's the big emphasis of today's passages. In what way can I honor God and my community with the wealth that I do have? You know, and we're, then we're talking about investments. How do you use your money? How do you invest your money? Some people... Though some people are teach other people about finances in the kingdom, think of every dollar bill as a soldier. Where are you going to send your soldiers? Are you going to send your soldiers to buy a Gucci bag? Or are you going to send your soldiers to go support the homeless? Again, nothing wrong with having materialistic things. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And don't think I'm condemning people who have materialistic things. I wish I had some designer stuff, but I don't. But at the end of the day, my question to myself is, if God richly blessed me, Am I going to just bless myself again? Or am I going to use that blessing to bless someone else? Or use it to build God's kingdom? And don't think that you're more spiritual because you do that. Because the reason and motivation of doing those things is for the glory and love of God. That's it. And so today's topic is not about which way is so much better. But is to develop a conversation within your heart and with God is saying, well, okay, if God blesses me financially, if God blesses me wealth, what am I going to do with it? There's nothing wrong with spending on yourself, but there, and there's nothing wrong with spending on others. It's just what are you going to do with it? That is the motivation behind it. That's going to give God the glory. And so Solomon was blessed with a lot of wealth. And it, you can't help but realize at the tail end of Second Chronicles, in terms of his part of it, it's just always talking about how rich he was, how wealthy he was. And I just wonder, was that something that he should have spent on the people or further advancing God's kingdom? Who knows? It's There's no right or wrong answers. This is one of those rare moments, um, not rare, but it's one of those moments where it's not, there's no like clear cut answer, but it's something that you and I have to wrestle with God because think about it. For Solomon, we, this accumulation, well, some people think it's it was wrong. 
because some people believe the moment Solomon entered into kingship, that's when in Israel's history for the first time we see poverty in the kingdom because there's going to be people who are rich and there's going to be people who are not rich. And then since Solomon was so rich, he should have distributed that. Or, you know, some people call that socialism, whatever. whatever. But the reality is this. The core question we have to ask ourselves is this, when it comes to wealth, what you gonna do with it? If you buy yourself a nice house, God bless, give God the glory, give him the praise. Buy yourself some nice clothes, hey, nothing wrong with that. But a question you're gonna have to ask yourself is that if that's all we do with it, if that's all you do with it for the rest of your life, you keep just buying stuff for yourself, then you have to ask yourself, what is, what is the what is my motivation? What is the condition of my heart when I get blessed with these things? What does God really want me to do? And if I'm gonna be honest with you, um, I from so my practical tip that I did for myself was that I asked myself, how do I use my money? You know, do I want to buy? Do I want to use my money to buy more sneakers? Or do I want to do I want to buy use my money to invest in experiences with people? Now again, I could have nice sneakers. I could have nice experiences. Neither one is inherently wrong or bad, but the question then I have to ask myself is what do I want to invest in? And I know this this, this is not an investment seminar, it's not a money management seminar, it's just the core principle is this when God blesses you, more specifically financially. What you're gonna do with it? Because sometimes, before we ask God what to do with it, we just completely spend it, and we just can be do whatever we want with it, whether good or bad. But why not ask God, Lord, you bless me with this. What do you want me to do with it? And He might say, give it to the poor, or He might say, hey, do it's yours. Do bless. To do whatever you want with it. But the key principle is, are we gonna go God, are we gonna go to God with it for him to lead us and direct us in how to use it? That's the, I think, question for today's devotional, all right? Um, so don't go out there condemning people because they didn't do anything spiritual with the money or that they're becoming too, like, the big lesson here today is not whether you did something spiritual or not with the money. It's whether you, you consulted the Lord who gave you that money, what he wants you to do with that money. All right. Be blessed. It's rainy. It's cold. Stay warm. Stay safe.